Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our monthly committee meetings to set the agenda. Uh, at this time, what we're going to do, hold on, we're going to hold on for a second. Take your time. Oh, already online. I didn't know. Are we uh, live yet? Okay, thank you, and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending our monthly committee meetings to set the agenda. For some clerical purposes for this evening, uh, our committee chairs will be calling their agenda forward, uh, presenting their agenda for their committees. Committees will have the opportunity to ask questions, as well as then board members will, and the community. Um, we do have both a live format as well as a virtual format. And, ooh, we got a little bit of Okay, I think we got that fixed. Thank you. Um, so with that being said, uh, we just asked that because we're doing both a virtual as well as a live in-person meeting, uh, we're going to open up opportunities uh, for both the in-person as well as the virtual questions to be asked. I do ask that as we enter into a committee, um, please begin to post your questions. Um, uh, we have uh, Mr. Blanchard will then ask those questions on the behalf of those people that are virtual, and we'll be able to answer them as swiftly uh, and as appropriately as possible. We also have a presentation for this evening. Um, so from that being said, I, I just again want to thank everyone for being here this evening. We have uh, one, two, four board members here in present, and I believe all five board members are present uh, virtually, but we're going to have Mrs. Otera do a roll call at this time. Here. 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 Present. Here. 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 Thank you very much, Mrs. Otero. And at this time, I'd ask uh, our superintendent, Mr. Mahalik, if you have any uh, welcoming message as well, if you, if you would share with us who is uh, present from the administration, both in person as well as those in our virtual platform. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to welcome uh, all of our attendees this evening. We have a great amount of people watching from home so thank you so very much joining us on this beautiful day um, please let us know if you can hear us well or at least uh, as clear as can be expected in this format again thank you so much for joining us we have with us this evening uh, we do have mrs beth ann harris our supervisor of uh, special programs and behavioral health mrs bonnie gregory she is our uh, Rice Elementary Principal, Mr. Kevin Sayre. He is our Fairview Principal. Of course, Mrs. Otero, who is with us each and every day. We, <clears throat> excuse me, we have Mr. John Gorham, Secondary uh, Principal. Mrs. Foster, Secondary Principal. Mr. Brummagen, Director of Facilities. Of course, Mr. Um, Blanchard is here as well. Uh, and I believe that concludes the administrative team. And I thank you all again for being with us uh, this evening. Um, I just, uh, Mr. President, again, like to thank the viewing audience. We have over 
100 viewers. Uh, we will answer each and every question that is posed to us. Uh, we will follow the curriculum, uh, or we will follow the agenda. Um, and if there are questions specific to that agenda uh, committee, we will take them. Uh, and then if there's general questions, we can wait to the end of the committee meetings to uh, have open discussion with that. So with that, Mr. President, I will uh, bring it back to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mahalik. And at this time, if you would like, uh, please call your first committee uh, for meeting. Thank you, sir. We will begin our monthly committee meetings of this October 8, 2020. We will start with co-curricular agenda. I know we do have Mr. Swank, our chairman, available, and we have Mrs. McCurdy joining us. So uh, I will hand it over to uh, Mr. Swank. Uh, thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Uh, we have one item to approve on the co-curricular uh, committee agenda, and that's to approve the minutes of the co-curricular committee meeting on September 10th, 2020. I so move. If Mrs. McCurdy can second that. I'll second that motion, Mr. Costello. Okay, we got a second from Mr. Costello. Thank you. Mr. Swink, we do have a second on the floor for the uh, approval of the minutes uh, from roll our- Roll call or all in me. favor? All in favor or roll call? Uh, all in favor. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that will uh, conclude. There are no discussion items, so at this time I'll ask for uh, a motion for adjournment of the co-curricular agenda, co-curricular committee meeting. I'll make that uh, motion. Do I have a second? Second, and all in favor. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much, Mr. Swank. Uh, Mr. Blanche, are we good with uh, Zoom? Can Zoom hear us? They cannot hear on Facebook. Okay, so we're going to speak uh, as loud as we can for our uh, for the people on Zoom with us. Uh, we will now open our Human Resources Committee meeting. Uh, in attendance, we have Mr. Swank and we have uh, Mr. Brogna joining us via Zoom. So I will hand that to uh, Mr. Brogna if he's able to hear us. If not. Um, we will have Mr. Uh, Mr. Costello take his, uh, his position. Sure, absolutely. Um, it looks like we don't have anything on our agenda other than to approve the September 15th, 2020 minutes for human resources. I so move and I'll be asking for a second. Mr. Swank did give Mr. a Swank, second. Mr. Swank, can you give us a second? <laughs> yeah, I heard him. Okay. And then we'll just do uh, a real quick all in favor um, on the accepting of the minutes of September 15th, 2020. All those in favor? Aye. And on aye. And I believe that concludes our uh, meeting for human resources at this time. Thank you to our human resources committee. We are now moving to our technology committee agenda. We have Mrs. Bibla as our Chairperson, Mrs. Haddix, and Mrs. McCurdy. Uh, Mrs. Bibla. We have one agenda item to approve the minutes of last September 10th. I so move. Excellent. And Mr. Costello, while they were working on our technical, can you uh, second that? I got a second on everything that's coming our way, buddy. Okay, you just sir. keep sending them our way, and, and thank you for that. Thank you. Second. All in favor. And that's an eye for me Mahalik, for an all in favor. Called on, uh, Jim Brogan. We lost then, audio about five minutes ago. You can't hear anything from no the auditorium. You can just move to close then. All right. I move to close. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you so very much. I know we did have Mr. Brogan there for a moment. 
Okay, we will now open the Transportation Committee. We have uh, Mrs. Bibla. We have Mrs. We Mr. lost audio in the Zoom meeting. We, we do have audio. We can now hear audio on Zoom. So we have Mrs. Bibla. We are going into our Transportation Committee. Mrs. Bibla and Mr. Brogna. One item on the agenda to approve the minutes of the committee meeting September 10th. I so move. We do have a second on our transportation. All in favor, aye. Aye. Move to adjourn. Second. Thank you to our transportation committee. We now will open up our positive behavior intervention committee. We have Mrs. Bibla, our chairwoman. We have Mrs. Haddix in attendance. And I will uh, give that to Mrs. Bibla. One agenda item, approve the minutes of our committee meeting September 10th. I so move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. No other discussion items? Move to adjournment. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. We now will open up our policy committee. Mrs. McCurdy is our chairwoman. Mr. Brogna uh, is in attendance as well. So can we uh, get Mrs. McCurdy or should I bring that to Someone else, can we hear Mrs. McCurdy? We cannot hear anything from the auditorium though. Okay, Mr. Brono, can you take it? Take over. Uh, I can hear now, yes. Okay. I don't know what I don't know what transpired over the last ten minutes. Because no audio came from the auditorium. Okay. Since Mr. Mahalik's introduction. Unmuted. Oh, okay. Not my extent. So no one heard anything that happened since about 4.05 externally. All were voted basically nothing on discussion. Policy. Sadly, enough. So. Co curricular had nothing, resources had nothing, tech had nothing, education had nothing, positive behavior had nothing, or anything that would change. So, are we ready for finance committee? No, we're up to policy, but Lauren must not. I don't know. I've had several messages from people that no one could hear externally, so I don't know how, how this is happening. Uh, if we can't have participation or or board members' participation that are online. Okay. Well, I think. Uh, all right. So we're on we're policy. On policy. Uh, and so. Uh, you said, but Miss, but Lauren is on the line. She just can't speak. Is yeah, Kim there? Kim is here. Kim is not here. So we don't have a committee then. Yes. Yeah, Mr. We have everybody else. Uh, okay, Mr. Castell. Robinson. Mr. Brona, are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mr. Brona. So yes. So Mrs. Spath is not with us, um, but I believe we have Mrs. McCurdy, and I believe we have uh, yourself, and so that would make uh, two of the three members, and we could move forward with two of the three members of the committee. Okay. All right. Uh, so we, we'll pick up with uh, post-roll call uh, uh, 
seeking approval of the minutes of the policy uh, committee for September 10th from the September 10th meeting. Second by Randy Swank. Is a non-committee member allowed to approve uh, the, the minutes? Now let's, the, the second should come from either Mrs. McCurdy or Mr. Costello. Um, I'll second that item, Mr. Costello. Okay, I mean, I can't, I guess we can't take Warren's live vote, but all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, point four, we'll recommend consideration and approval of the following, uh, third reading and adopt uh, policy number 332. I don't have the policy in front of me, so I physically can't read it. If Mr. Costello or Mr. Mahalo could read the policy, if there's any concerns. I have not been provided the policy either, so we can... Um, third reading. This is a third reading of this policy, so we can choose to not pass it forward if there's any concerns or to move it forward and can review the policy prior. Yes, we, so we'll we, move on to discussion items. Recommend be and they are actually attachments, not change policy added on. To the okay, and, and, and do, is there is there any discussion or concerns over those those recommended I, uh, policy I, items? I believe that it was just to bring it to the table that they are recommended by the PSBA. They just came and they attached them. Excellent. Um, is there any any comments from the board? Comments from uh, yes, as an attachment, uh, do they have to be approved by the entire board or can we just attach to present policy an administrative regulation? I looked it over and all it is, it's a two page document explaining uh, sudden cardiac arrest and apparently the uh, student and parent are to sign the second page of the form uh, stating that they read it and it explains that uh, should you you are aware of what symptoms are of sudden cardiac arrest and that should you demonstrate any symptoms that uh, remove yourself from competition or play or physical activity and uh, and then have to get okayed by a doctor. So it, it's just a, a form, I think, for ed primarily extracurricular to be signed and returned. So we, do, do we need board action on an administrative requirement? Are you saying to do that for this year, though? This is a form that you want starting fall or spring? I, I would winter say sports? once adopted, uh, it would be going forward. It would not be retroactive. So for winter sports? For winter sports from then on. Uh, Wait, one. Well, uh, it's on discussion. Yes. So we're we're we're, 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 we're we're these are discussion items that right, relate to right the second part. Right now, right now they're under discussion, so we don't need to move those forward. Okay. Um, and have further discussions at our Let's next policy. Yeah. yeah, my request was, do we have any other board comment on any of the policies, um, including the 332? Do we have any other comment on the 332? So what, what are we doing? We're moving he that forward? To, he wants to know if we should move forward with vote or? Uh, uh, we could just, uh, since uh, I think it's since it's uh, just administrative, we can just uh, put it on vote. Oh, 332? 332 on the third motion. Oh, yeah, move that one forward. He said, yes, yes, definitely yeah. move that one forward. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we'll move that any one further, to be voted. Any further comment from the public or the board? Any comment from the public? No, not at this time. All right, I'll be seeking a motion for adjournment of the policy committee. I believe there's some discussion items under item five. 
um, that need to be addressed. Yeah, that's what we were just saying, that he was... So they are, they are just to be moved They're, forward? Yeah, then I second the motion to... Okay. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Okay. Castello. Favor? Oh. Aye. 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 Okay, thank you so very much, our policy committee. At this time, we will move forward to our financial planning committee. We have Mr. Brogna as our chairman. We do have Mr. Swank and Mr. Boone in attendance. Mr. Brogna, I will give it to you. Yes, uh, uh, thank you for your presence. I'll be seeking the approval of the minutes from the finance planning committee from September 10th. Second, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, as, as item number four, uh, we'll turn this over to uh, Mr. DeVato from Crabtree and Rohrbach and Associates to update and show options on the administrative suite, uh, the house that was acquired and transitioned into classroom space. Uh, Mr. DeVato? Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. I uh, appreciate the accommodations for the virtual uh, Zoom call. Um, this afternoon, uh, I, I want to talk about a few items relative to the house, uh, as, as well as the district office, the current district office spaces. Um, uh, I've been working with Mr. Bromagen. Um, recently, I sent him a report or an analysis uh, of my survey of the house. Um, and I also uh, have a PowerPoint presentation for you this afternoon. Um, we'll go right into the analysis of the house itself uh, in the presentation. So I'm going to share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? You can see that now? Um, so um, there's two components. Uh, I've been working with the, the staff in terms of the overall uh, feasibility study for the district, uh, and I've spoken to uh, many of you uh, already to date. Um, this was a side task. Uh, I was contacted by the district to come up and look at the existing house as well as the district office spaces. Um, I did that a couple of weeks ago, um, and this presentation is kind of a summary of that and it's to get you to discuss some of the potential options to have moving forward, as well as some of the um, components of that study um, that we have to continue to work on or look at more in depth. Um, and I also have, um, and not to alarm you, I have some a range of cost or an order of magnitude, if you will, um, so that you can understand uh, what is um, really the, the, the efforts um, going forward uh, for you as a district to use that house. Okay. So the agendas I just talked about, I'm going to go through the existing district offices. Uh, I'm going to look at the house itself. Um, we're going to talk about uh, briefly the level of renovation efforts. Um, and then we'll go through uh, the preliminary cost data. Can everybody see the screen with a floor plan of the existing district offices? Yes. Okay. Uh, just to give you some orientation, yes. at the lower part of the screen, there's a series of doors. This is the current access 
um, if you will, for the public from outside into the hallway across from the district offices. Um, currently, you have several office spaces dedicated in there for the district functions. Um, the numbers associated work with the um, legend to the right that is in green and orange. Um, and we know that over time, uh, you've made some different moves within that space. You've erected some partitions within that space. Uh, there are a couple of shared toilet rooms, uh, as well as a toilet facility out here. And currently, Dr. Mihalik's office is up on this end, which comes off of this corridor. So I looked at this space from an architectural standpoint. Um, we know that you're doing some upgrades to your air conditioning and your heating systems within the building. Anything going forward, if you put classrooms in here, you would have to modify within this space that distribution. Um, there are some code um, items that you would have to look at for extending fire alarm into different rooms, et cetera. Um, and we want to talk about ultimately the program that really is going to go in here. Uh, I have an idea, but um, we did not venture down the path of an exact program. That's something that would follow up this discussion. But I have enough information uh, to start the process from. So um, if looking at bringing in two special ed classroom spaces, you have a, many options within this space. Um, if you look at the vertical walls on either side of the colored sh um, shapes, this represents basic masonry walls of that space. All the internal space walls um, that divide the offices up currently are typically gypsum board um, and metal stud. And they can be removed to accommodate classroom spaces and or any support spaces that you may see. Um, in this venue or in this visual that I have provided, I'm looking at providing two special ed classroom spaces, some uh, existing spaces such as the toilets and the faculty uh, workroom could remain as um, that. They could be um, those storage or support rooms. Um, you could also put in here some support spaces, some small group breakout areas, a conference area. Um, that's something to be determined by a program space uh, analysis. Um, but in, a, in essence, you could put two classroom spaces in here, um, modify the electrical and mechanical systems a bit, um, and accommodate some additional program pieces. I would envision this at this point, unless we modify more walls or more access into the space uh, using the existing corridor and the existing main door, um, I, would, I would see that you would have to use both spaces to get to the classrooms. You could link the classrooms internally. You could do a whole number of things in there. Uh, but this is kind of, an, kind of a test fit, if you will, uh, on this. Uh, so again, we'll need more programming discussions uh, prior to going out to a contractor for construction documents. Uh, in construction, um, and we'll also have to, have to look at the level of renovation. It, at this point, I see removing all those interior partitions to make larger classroom spaces. That means you would upgrade all your floor finishes, your wall finishes. It would upgrade your electrical system, uh, technology systems, and, and you would ultimately put in new ceiling uh, systems and lighting uh, within those spaces to accommodate the program. There are some challenges with this, um, and I'll talk a bit more about them in the cost estimate uh, as we move forward. Are there any questions? Uh, bathrooms uh, still in the plan there? That, Larry? I did not. Okay, Barry, I can ask you. Can... Barry, ask uh, again. Uh, uh, bathrooms still, still included there in the uh, classrooms or adjacent to the classrooms? Yes. Uh, currently, I've left in this plan, I have left the two existing small faculty toilet rooms here. Uh, we would look to probably upgrade this toilet area up here to a fully compliant ADA uh, bathroom. We could also look at extending plumbing into these classroom spaces if that is part of the program. Thank you. Very good question. Okay. 
So let's move to um, the single family residence, um, Mr. Mr. Boone's property. So um, when I surveyed the property, um, I looked at it visually from the exterior. I walked the property, I took photographs, um, and then I went inside the, the facility itself to each of the spaces, documented the material conditions. Um, I also dimensioned the entire structure and have a couple of floor plans here that we drew up for discussion purposes. Again, um, th this was constructed probably in the mid 80s as a, sing as a single family residence. We call them raised ranches or split levels, if you will, um, because the staircase that's in the center of the plan serves both the upper and lower floor. That poses some challenges um, moving forward, uh, but you can see in this existing floor plan, this is the lower level. Um, you can enter um, currently uh, through this rear door adjacent to the exterior screen porch. Um, there's several large rooms. I do have photos of them in the presentation, um, but essentially they had it set up with two bedrooms on the lower floor, um, uh, a, a toilet facility, uh, storage uh, spaces. The building currently is served by uh, electric heat, electric baseboard heat. Um, there is well water on the property and the property is also on a septic system. So those are some of the items that we have to look at further in depth uh, as we change the use of this structure um, from a code stand. Essentially, this structure is approximately 2,700 square feet. It's very comparable to the area of the district offices in um, currently in, in the high school, middle school. So uh, I took some liberties to try a test fit of some of these spaces that are moving, potentially moving from the district offices to this house as intended. We would want to talk about providing a secure entry access point, uh, potentially on the exterior of the building in the back. And I say that because the driveway is to the left of this floor plan and access would be at grade and into that lower level. That would be easy to do um, without coming through the, the garage door. And that's something we would talk about modifying anyway. And again, this is a test fit. This is not a final program. Um, I have not had any program meetings with anyone to determine which office should go in what location. But uh, I was just looking at square footage comparisons uh, my, uh, district office. We would talk about installing some additional partitions to break the spaces into offices or more accessible spaces, if you will. We would look to keep the toilet facilities. There is toilet facilities on both levels of the house. We would look to improve them uh, on the lower level for ADA access. So here's how uh, I first envisioned this you have a waiting or reception area for visitors to be allowed into the building. You have a conference room on this level so that any district meetings, any staff meetings could be accommodated in this space. There is the ability to um, talk about this renovation of this toilet space and some storage. As with any district por uh, program, we anticipate that you're going to have storage needs. In a residential structure, the best opportunity for accommodating that storage would probably be on the lower level because it's concrete slab on grade. If we go to put heavy storage usage up on the upper floors, we probably have to get into a structural engineer to uh, verify if that floor structure could hold those additional weights. So that's something that we would have to explore. So I looked at possibly putting uh, a staff workroom on this level. Um, with a copier uh, in any of those uh, storage or mail facilities that they may need. Um, and then the other spaces would be divided up into offices such as accounts payable, payroll, and transportation. Again, there may be some adjacencies in a program that we have to meet 
of how the office actually functions, uh, but again, this is a test fit. Any questions on the lower level? Uh, this is the floor plan of the existing upper level of the house. Again, this is the only circulating stair uh, to the second floor. There's a couple of code things we have to discuss um, right off the bat. You'll probably need a second means of egress off of this floor from a code standpoint. Um, but probably more important to that, we have to look at the federal guidelines because if you're gonna occupy this second floor from an accessibility standpoint, the ADA guidelines indicate that you must make that accessible. That's on the federal level. Um, a local code official may say, I'm okay if you occupy it. However, you must be uh, aware of the federal guidelines that would take precedence and you may be forced to put in, I'm not saying an elevator, but that is an option where you may have to put a large ramp system in, get up to this level, as well as a, a means of egress from that floor. So you may have to put an exterior stair on the building to access or egress the second way up. Now currently the space is divided up. The screen porch to the left is a three season screen porch. Um, the living room and dining room and kitchen areas are all open in the current floor plan. Um, and then as typical of a house, they have multiple bedrooms with small closet spaces in there and they have a single uh, bathroom in there uh, as you would in a, any house. Um, there are opportunities to make these spaces larger if you remove the, the uh, closet spaces in each room. Again, that's something that we could discuss down the road. Uh, are these spaces adequately sized without modifying all of the closets? Um, of note, you'll probably want to talk about replacing the finishes in the house. Um, uh, the carpet uh, with with a more um, appropriate flooring material uh, from a uh, facility standpoint. Um, the house does need a good coat of paint inside. Um, there are some lighting uh, fixtures obviously associated with a residential house that you'll probably want to change off for business use. Um, and then you want to talk about those task level lightings for people to work in their office space. So as I did on the lower floor, I took some opportunities, um, put in a uh, potential uh, uh, set of spaces or a space in, uh, diagram for you. Um, it would install uh, some additional partitions to break spaces. Um, and then I associated some of those names of apartments or offices within there. Um, I have a business office. Um, off of the kitchen area, I made a small staff area that was the dining area. Um, Tim's coordinator, superintendent's secretary, and the superintendent's office. And this is something to be discussed. Um, when I briefly spoke with Dr. Mihalik, um, he indicated that somewhere, even in the high school, that he'd still like to have a presence of a small office there. Uh, so when he's going back and forth on the campus. Um, so again, these are programming discussions at another level um, that we can discuss. Um, these are just some of the existing photos. If you're not familiar with the house or have not been to the house, um, this is the, uh, to the right is the driveway approach and the overhead garage door. Uh, this is the walkway in front of the house and up the steps to that, that split level. If you will. As you can see, um, the floor level is still up another half set, so we would have to go up quite high with a ramping system uh, to work that, but there may be something we can do with the grades to uh, lessen that. Um, the picture on the right is from the exterior. This is where I would talk about creating that secure vestibule um, uh, that would allow people to come to the door. You can admit them into the receipt, uh, the reception area um, without them physically coming into the building right away. It's just a safety and security thing that we talk more about. Um, to the right of that is the existing screen porch and we can discuss that from a program. The two pictures on the left that are stacked are the current conditions of the kitchen and the dining area. Um, previous owner removed some of the appliances 
if you're going to make this into a kitchen, you're talking about a refrigerator stove uh, and, and looking at the existing appliances that are there. Uh, this is on the lower level. Um, the sliding glass door actually goes out to that screen porch. Um, the, uh, this is a long, narrow room. This is kind of the front part of this is where I would see receiving or, or the reception area. Uh, we can make part of that back area into that conference uh, as well. And I'm talking about doing this without expanding the footprint significantly on the house because that's cool. Um, as is typical of most houses with the closet spaces, uh, this is the large bedroom on the lower level um, that can be used for offices, um, as well as dividing up the current garage space into. Again, an exterior photo on the left of the front of the house. Um, all the windows, um, the exterior stucco material on the front of the house, uh, all appear in, in good condition. Uh, I would assume that the house roof has been replaced at least once in its lifetime, um, but probably in the next you know, five to ten years, um, we'll probably look at upgrading that unless you added it on as part of this project. Um, the right-hand picture is a picture of that current dining area. Uh, you can see the electric baseboard heat. Uh, and as typical of a house, uh, there's a lot of operable windows to allow for both daylight as well as fresh air. The house is also served by um, a central air conditioning system, and we would have to analyze that to make sure that we can provide proper cooling as all these offices would be occupied on a daily basis. Any questions on the house? Okay. So, um, as I said, there's some challenges with each of the projects from a code and zoning standpoint. Um, and, and those are things that we would look to in uh, a schematic, schematic phase, if you will, uh, prior to proceeding. The assessment that I'm giving you today is going to give you that order of magnitude. So you can say, well, we didn't know it was going to be this costly, or is this something we really want to pursue? Um, and, and what is the long-term effects? The benefits to the district um, and, and, and how does it help us educationally. So um, those are some of the things that need additional discussion, but I wanted to give you an idea of, of, of how I approach this. So from a cost estimate uh, summary, first we have to determine in the scope what level of renovation we're talking about in all of these spaces, whether it's in the school or in the house. Um, we know there's some finishes within the house that really should be taken care of and upgraded. Um, and likewise, in the high school, uh, middle school building, we can't just move a classroom in there. We have to modify the interiors to uh, But we can talk about the different levels of renovation as we start to look at that budget picture. Um, so that will lead us into a more detailed scope of work cost estimate. Uh, today I'm giving you a range of cost, um, but ultimately we want to keep refining that cost so that we truly know if you go to bid the high school project uh, or the, the classroom project at the high school, um, what that's going to entail. Um, it is a small project. There may be a premium from contractors for doing a small project. Um, we are uh, all dealing with the effects of the COVID-19 virus and what that's doing to both cost as well as what it's doing to delivery of materials. Um, I can tell you we have multiple projects going in construction right now and, and we're seeing manufacturers behind on some of their deliveries. Um, so we have to take that into account. Uh, if you're ideally going to look to do this project for the start of school next year, uh, and to, for occupancy, then we really want to make sure we have enough time built into that schedule to allow the contractors to get the proper materials on site. Um, and, that, and that's critical right now. So that, that'll come as we discuss. So in terms of looking at the, the district offices, 
converting them into classrooms. Um, we know that you have, uh, again, existing systems that we'll have to modify from an engineering standpoint. We're going to have interior partitions and walls. We're going to have new lighting, new ceiling, new finished materials, um, and, and, and obviously new doors and things like that. So um, I did a cost estimate not only by square foot, um, but I also put some of the ancillary costs that you don't see when we talk about bricks and sticks. So I did a cost estimate that involves all the associated costs that you may see as part of that project. Um, if you have uh, code review fees, we have an allowance in there. If we have uh, any issues with um, abatement, that's an allowance item that we want to talk more about. If we have anything from uh, a system standpoint, uh, I'm imagining electrical in those spaces would have to be completely redone. They're going to bring new technology in those spaces. So I've accommodated some of those costs in my estimate. I've also looked at the cost that you would have from a professional fee in terms of how a contractor would bid this, where their profit would come in, uh, and, and, and all of that associated building costs. The only thing that we don't have in here um, from a cost standpoint is what are those code items that a code official may say are above what we're expecting here. Uh, I'm not experiencing any at all in the classroom renovation project, um, but that's something uh, that could come up in the house. And also in the classroom process, we want to make sure you're aware that at some point, you're going to have to put furniture in these spaces. I don't know if you have that on hand currently or if that's going to be an additional cost to my cost estimate. Um, again, this is an order of magnitude. I'm not trying to alarm anyone, um, but this is comparable to what we're seeing on small projects um, in, in, in uh, our, our arena. So on my low end, we're probably talking in the neighborhood of five to six hundred thousand dollars to renovate this space, up to maybe seven hundred, seven hundred twenty-five thousand uh, dollars, and that's providing you look to do this project next spring. Are there any questions on the high school classroom fit up? Again, the intent would be to. Look at more detailed scopes of work. Um, let's really design a space, have engineers put some costing to it. Let's talk to some of the local contractors that could potentially bid this work um, and say, hey, what, what are you guys seeing? If I give you this plan, what are you seeing? Can you give me a ballpark number so that we can have a better uh, idea of, of where this would lead? Okay. I'm gonna move on to the house. So again, the house analysis, uh, I made several assumptions based on my analysis, um, looked at the existing systems. The house is a bit more challenging because there's some code components out there um, that, that have to be determined. In addition, if you think of that site um, for the house, there is a driveway leading up to that. Um, I don't think you would expect seven or eight staff members come and park along that driveway every day and say, hey, I have to get out. Can you move your car? So we'll probably have to look at creating a small parking area. Um, question is, does that parking area have to be paved? Can it be a stoned uh, parking lot? Um, and does that trigger any stormwater requirements um, from the local Department of Environmental Protection that we're going to have to accommodate that, that stormwater? Uh, I don't think, uh, Mr. Boone, if I can use you for an example, I don't think you would be too happy if that stormwater suddenly went down the hill and it entered into your basement of your house. So those are things we have to be considerate of uh, as we move forward from that code standpoint that we don't quite have a handle on. I did put some basic allowances into those items, um, but they may change as we get into that more analysis. Okay. Um, and you may say, wow, $75,000 to $100,000 of expenditure on this house, can we do better than that? I think you can. Um, there are a lot of scope items in question here. Um, 
But as soon as you look at the condition of that house and realize that some of those materials are not appropriate for office spaces, I'm not saying we're moving and tearing out all the walls. You can elect to do that. But I think if you're looking to fit proper spaces in here, uh, you're probably in this range here, along with any systems we have to upgrade. Um, this will also take care of some of those uh, ADA compliance items, such as door handles and access into the building. This would accommodate uh, a second floor stair coming down to grade on the exterior of the building so that you have a second means of egress. This obviously does not accommodate an elevator system in the building. Um, and this would also uh, uh, probably upgrade, more than likely upgrade, the electrical panel distribution in the house. A typical house is served by a 100 amp panel. Typically in a business setting like this with technology and computers and printers, we'll probably have to upgrade that panel to uh, a 200 amp service. We wanna make sure uh, from a code standpoint about a fire alarm system in here so I've made some of those allowances within my estimate here that I think are, are uh, appropriate. So the next steps would be that, you know, this is a lot for the board to digest. I understand that. Um, there's a lot of moving parts to that. There's still unknowns. Um, but this could start that dialogue to say, if we're gonna move forward with a project, what is the timeline to do that? How do we appropriately do that? Um, are we willing to spend you know, uh, a half a million dollars or so to accommodate this move in these spaces? Um, and, and, and again, what is the timing of that process? From an education standpoint, I understand Dr. Mihalik's um, goal is to bring special education classes back to this building um, to support those students and those local families. So there's an educational component um, or goal, if you will, uh, that has a big factor in this decision. Um, and, and that is not, um, that's for you to talk more. Uh, with that, I'll open it up to any questions. Are there any questions from the board? Uh, uh, Mr. Brogan, I have no questions. Uh, this is Mr. Mahalik. Uh, I just uh, want to thank Larry so very much for providing exactly what we were looking for. Uh, and there's a lot of, lot of good discussion uh, points for us, Mr. Brogan. Uh, Mr. Mahalik, are there any questions from the public about this project? Uh, Mr. Blanchard, uh, I don't, okay, there's a question from Courtney Lomax. How will this project be funded? Um, and uh, Courtney, <clears throat> this is still very much in the discussion phases so uh, th th we are not moving forward. What we wanted from Mr. Lovato and his company was the opportunity uh, to see what we believe the cost would be associated with this. So there's no discussion right now on the funding. Uh, and, and obviously we would do a cost analysis uh, to see. Bob, Okay. Can, can everybody hear me? Okay. Okay. Uh, the, the message, the message was, from, was from from Courtney. From Courtney. It, was, it was how will this project be funded? Be funded? Uh, Courtney, Courtney, we are very much in the exploratory stages, stages with this project. This project. Uh, something, uh, like, something this like this takes, takes uh, uh, two years, two years sometimes, sometimes even longer. longer. There's, There's a lot of steps, steps to go through, through with the with Department, Department of Education. Of Education. Uh, so uh, what we are we're really doing right now right is now exploring, uh, uh, and, and part of that would be the cost analysis. analysis. So uh, uh, when we when would we get to a get point of making a making determination if this was feasible, uh, both, uh, both educationally, educationally and, financially, and financially, then, then we, would we would certainly look at, look at the financing, financing part, of part of it. it. So 
but we asked Larry and, and his company to provide us with that estimate, so it really allowed us the opportunity to see if this is um, something that might be doable in the future. Will we receive an update on the 1920 audited financials? Yes, absolutely. Mr. Mahalik, are there any other questions for the public about uh, um, presentation? Any other any questions, other questions, Mr. Blanchard, on this? That's the, that's nope, that's all, all we have, have from the, the, the public, public, Mr. Brogna. Bob, okay, you might have you. a, this young man I'm might have a question here. I'm sending items five on the agenda, and I'm going to ask Mr. Bard uh, to lead us through. This is recommended consideration uh, the following moving forward to a board meeting uh, for next week, October 15th. Items one, two, and three. Mr. Bard, will you discuss it? Uh, Mr. Brogna, there is a individual, there's a member here um, of the, uh, there's somebody here that may have a question, young man. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Joseph Otero, I, I'm a junior uh, here at Crestwood, and uh, uh, this is not about the, the house, but I have to go to band practice now, and I just really wanted to say that I think that we should go back in person, even if it is, you know, hybrid two days uh, a week. There is almost 300 people that agree with me that I uh, put out a petition and I got uh, 267 people to sign that agree with me that we need to go back in person uh, because the home is not a learning environment. I myself am struggling uh, very much with this online school and I've never thought it was a good idea from the beginning. I know that there's others out there who agree with me, and there's a lot that could be said. And I know there is COVID issues and everything like that, but I think we should wear masks, social distance, and get us back to school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brother, you, you, you can continue there. Thank you. I, was, I'm, I apologize. It's difficult to hear someone presenting from the auditorium for all those that are virtual. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Brogna, he, he said, said that, that um, he would he like would to, like to um, return, return to school in person, in person um, um, that, that the, the that learning in the home, home is not conducive and he's struggling um, learning at home and that he put out a petition for through with 300 signatures and 267 people have signed it so far and that he strongly encouraged the Board of Education to uh, we send the kids back to school in person. You're welcome. So for number, I'm going to start the uh, agenda, recommend consideration of the following and moving forward to the board uh, meeting on October 15th. The following, recommend the board approve the transfer of 295315 from the Landmark Community Bank to Capital Projects Account. It's a CD, the FNB Capital Projects Account, the Fieldhouse to pay for all outstanding bills on the field house and any out other outstanding capital project accounts. During the audit, there was two accounts that were brought to my attention that have capital fund money in it. The um, field house account was used uh, to purchase the house that we just talked about for 221,000, as well as a middle school roofing project that was another 250,000. And that is the reason why the field house account is short um, these monies. Now there are the landmark account has this 295,315. This dates back to 20, 2006. I'm not really unsure why it goes back that far, and neither was our financial advising team either. Um, so the transfer of these funds are to pay outstanding bills that have not yet been paid totaling $341,000. Uh, the one includes a bill that was paid on September, that was approved on September, the September board meeting. And then there's some other ones that are outstanding as well that total um, an additional, uh, the additional 200, a little over 200,000. They will not be paid until the work is completed and finished until and approved by Scott Brummagen and, and Bob Mahalik to the best of the boards uh, and to the best um, and to their satisfaction. So there are some outstanding work that needs to be done and completed. 
I believe, um, if I don't believe the project is, is vastly over budgeted, I believe that it was, um, I believe that the, the purchases of the, the, the house, that was something that you really couldn't pass up. And the work on the middle school roof, um, that the, the weatherproofing that was done as well out of, the, out of the, uh, that project fund was the reason for the over expenditure of the fund. Um, so that's why I want to transfer that money into the account. Pete, yes, uh, sir. one question. You said, did you say there were two accounts that you uncovered yes, capital there was, monies? There is, there is a second one. Um, it's on your, every month you receive a, a treasurer's report. And on that treasurer's report, this account has been there. I've looked back at them to make sure. It's the Johnny Montgomery Scott account. I had assumed that this was part of the general fund. However, it is not. It is a capital funds account that can only be used for capital projects. It has in it 352,216.41. That account is for capital projects only. Therefore, um, we're going to use some of that money to finish baseball and softball field so that there will be no impact to the general fund for any of the repairs that we are taking for the field out for the softball and baseball field as well. Super. Thanks, Pete. Yes. So there will be no impact to any general fund accounts for any of the work that the board has approved. Um, and that was some of the good news I wanted to give you guys as well, um, that there will be no general fund impact for any of these work, the work that we're taking for any of this um, work, because we can use these funds expressly and only for capital projects. Um, that's, the only, that's the only jurisdiction we have to expend the, the funds in that, in that particular manner. The funds need to be transferred, and I can't do it without a board vote. As a matter of fact, these accounts have to be updated because the signatories on the accounts are former board members that haven't been on the board for many years, because they're from 2006. So I don't know exactly um, what, ha what went on, you know, why they weren't expended back then, but we can use them for capital, uh, outstanding capital projects. My suggestion would be um, to hold on to some of that money for the for a boiler project or something of that nature that may need to be used for that um, But that's just a suggestion, but just so you guys are aware that there will be no impact to the general fund for Any of the baseball or softball fields. So when those bills come in you will just transfer some of them That's why I said in this in this motion any other outstanding capital projects so we can pay for some of the other um, baseball and softball base uh, renovations as well that we need to, that we need to undertake make those fields playable for the spring. Is there any questions from the board members or any of the public on that agenda item? And that also takes care of discussion item 5A. Oh. Mr. Blanchard, any questions? Thank you, no questions. We're, we're on item five or No, six? no, we're still on number five. Yes, okay. we're on number five, number two. Okay. Recommend, um, recommend consideration and approval of the agreement with the Crestwood School District and student number 00010-6348. Any comments or questions? And number three, recommend consideration and approval of the agreement with Luzerne County Head Start for the sponsor to sponsor of the CACFP retroactively. This agreement is for the food service with the um, Luzerne County Head Start. This is at no... Um, no cost to the school district. We just have to sign off on it. We need a motion and a second from the finance committee members um, to move these forward to the board meeting. Uh, motion. Motion from Mr. Boone. Second from Mr. Swank. There are all in favor. All in favor. Aye. Okay, Mr. Bru Mr. There was a there was three a all in favor. No, no, there was no, there was no none in favor. In favor. So, so, on number five, five, one, two, and three, move forward. Move forward. On the discussion, on the discussion items, items in number, number six, six number letter, letter A, a we, just we just talked about the capital, capital projects, projects fund with the Johnny Montgomery Scott. If you guys, like I said, look back on your treasurer's reports, you guys will see them, the accounts on there, um, going all the way back. I checked for the last two years they've been on there. Um, so letter B, for the budget timeline and possible meetings, I would like to have a meeting uh, the last Wednesday of the month 
uh, October 28th at 4 p.m. Most likely virtual will probably be the, the best way to do it. Um, to go over uh, a possible, just a very, very, very preliminary 21-22 uh, budget and also the timeline. Um, and also have a presentation from our health insurance broker um, to go over where we landed with the health insurance and, and whatnot. They are available to do a presentation. I figured that might be the best way to do it. Um, to answer any questions, if I want to make sure Mrs. Spath is available as well um, to attend that day. So I'll, I'll check with your availability um, in between the 8th and the 15th. Um, so we'll just, if you guys could check your availability, make sure you all are available and get back to me by next, on the 15th, so we could finalize that and um, make a final announcement on the 15th um, of that meeting date and time and also get it advertised appropriately if necessary. Um, I also want to talk about the letter C, the Act 1 index was finalized and announced by the Department of Education. The Crestwoods adjusted index is 3.7%. It's up from 3.2%, which it was last year. Last year, So it is up 0.5%. Um, and, you know, as, as we've talked about in past budget presentations, um, that is most likely going to be the point where the school taxes will go. So we'll have to see where, where we are at with the budget as we go along with that. But that is what the adjusted tax index is, or adjusted index is for the Crestwood School District is 3.7%. Yes, sir. State average, I know you talked about it was an increased recommendation from last year, um, both in terms of the state and the region. Um, you, have, you give us a, a synopsis on the breakdown. Do you have any further information about where that index leaves Crestwood? And yeah. explain the index, please. Yes, the, um, the, the Act 1 index is formulated by the, uh, the rate of, of, of wages increases in the economy in the state of Pennsylvania about three years ago. So it's a, it's a lagged index. So as the, as the economy and how the wages increased by a booming economy, how the economy was booming a couple years ago, um, so if the rate of wages increased by so many percentage points, that's factored into it. Uh, the rate of unemployment, how it was low, that factors into it. And then what they, so that's, that's what's factored into the base index. So the base index was 3.1%. And then what, how Crestwood gets the adjusted index is they look at the rate of um, poverty and they look at the rate of, um, they look at the rate of, I, I forget the other, of the, of, the, of the adjusted piece of it. Then they add that to the base index and that's how you get 3.7% for Crestwood. Some other areas are a little bit bigger, but Crestwood got the lowest addition to the adjusted part of it due to the fact that we have the lowest poverty, or the second lowest poverty rate in the county. I believe the lowest poverty rate belongs to the Dallas Area School District, but Crestwood got the second lowest poverty rate um, in, the, in the county. So we got the, lo the second lowest adjusted piece of the, of the puzzle to that. Um, but that's how they figure out the Act 1 index. So in theory, um, the COVID-19 index and how the, or the COVID-19 related um, contraction in the economy won't hit the, the tax number until probably 2023-24, a tax year. So that'll probably be when the Act 1 index will contract. And you could see that on a chart um, when the, when the uh, financial uh, collapse hit. It didn't affect the Act 1 index until probably three years after that. So it would be like it'd be a, the 2012-2013 school year. Right. And to answer the question from, and to answer the question also about the 1920 financial statements, um, hopefully they'll be available when the AFR is completed, and the AFR doesn't need to, will need will be completed by November 30th. So hopefully I'll be able to share though that information with you at the December financial planning committee um, meeting. So that's what my target is to share that information with everyone. That meeting. Thank you for your feedback. Do we have any questions? about those discussion items? Uh, yes, this is uh, Barry. Yes. Uh, on uh, Part A, the, uh, the baseball softball fields, uh, I know we signed a contract with Pepsi. I don't, uh, I don't know who would look into this, uh, Peter or whoever. Uh, 
there's a fulfillment that we would sell so many items within the school and without students being here, the school being open, I, I don't know what adjustments have to be made there if, if we have to give a year extension or whatever, but this ties into the baseball softball. Uh, I know we were talking about, I don't know when it would be done now or in the spring, the wiring for new scoreboards for the baseball and softball field and I know for the baseball field we have an anonymous donation to help us get started on that in Pepsi's contract and that's why I would like to make sure that we can keep that thing intact. Pepsi's contract, they, they told us they would donate to the district a scoreboard and I asked in, inside or outside, they said either way, so maybe we could uh, continue discussions with Pepsi, see where we stand, and possibly get a, a scoreboard donated for the softball field. So I, I can have that discussion with our Pepsi rep about that and ask them, um, considering the developments of the last couple of days, I could ask them what their, um, what their mindset is on that, considering that we're not the only school district going through that. Um, and find out because we just had a discussion with them about installing the machines about two weeks ago So I'll find out what their position is on that and I'll get back Thank and hopefully you. by next week Yeah, the only uh, point of reference I want to make mr. Barr is please as it relates to timelines and meetings and locations you work with board president our board president so he can make sure that uh, whatever dates you're setting up and locations, it's most convenient for uh, as many of our board members as, as possible. Well, sure, that's why I asked for the timelines, if anybody can be available or whatever the case may be, um, to work, we'll work it out for that. Thank but you. I apologize for that. Thank you. Yes, sir. The only question that I had, and I, I, I apologize if um, you answered this, uh, Mr. Boone, but uh, Allison Bichkovsky asked, when is the work on the baseball or softball, field, softball fields due to start now that we're in the second week of October? What was the question? So the, when the, the question work? asked is when is the work expected to begin with our baseball field and her concern, very good concern, is that we're in the second week of October. So, Mr. Boone, do you have an update, Mr. Costello? Uh, and I, I do know that uh, we are expected, I think, next week for the sodding process to begin. I believe that's correct, but we can get a specific date and answer from Mr. Brummagen and Mr. Ambosi, as I know they've been working in tandem. Uh, to coordinate the, the infield lay as well as the edging that will take place at both fields. And that's, I believe, our first phase of the project, the inlay of grass and the uh, edging system, as well as some drain. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brummagen, you are uh, with us via Zoom. Uh, were you able to hear the question? Are you able to respond? Again, we're looking at the timeline of the baseball field, uh, especially this first part of getting the sod down, uh, the drainage. Can you hear us, Mr. Brummagen? I can kind of make out what the question was about the baseball field. Because um, all I know is that they are planning to get the sod down. Um, even though it's the second week in October, they want to get it down so it takes over the winter so it's ready to play next spring. That's why they're forcing that issue now wait any longer, it will not be able to take and we'll have to wait till spring. Anything beyond that, I don't have information on. I, I was not uh, privy to that. Thank you. Thank you. If there's no other further comments or questions from the public, uh, I'll be seeing a motion from the chairman of the financial committee. Um, motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you so Thank very you much. Very we much. will close we'll the close financial, financial planning, planning committee, committee and we will and we'll go, go to our to physical, physical plant, plant and grounds and committee. Uh, Mrs. Haddix will be joining us uh, via Zoom. And Mr. Boone is here. Uh, Stacy, can you hear us? Okay. 
Yep, yep. I, I, I got, got you, Stacey. Okay, so Mr. Boone and I are present. Mrs. McGovern is absent. So I will move to approve the physical plant and grounds committee meeting minutes from September 10th. Second. And under the recommend consideration for the following and moving forward to the board meeting, uh, we did hear from Crabtree from their presentation. Uh, I'm not sure that we are ready to move anything for approval um, to next week's board meeting. Uh, Bob, I would ask if that is okay with you. I think you had mentioned there is some additional work that needs to be done uh, prior to putting that on a board agenda. Is that true? Uh, y yes, yes. <clears throat> there, there's a, a, a bit more. So I, I think, I mean, we, we could probably hold off on that, uh, Stacy, if, if that's fine with you. Uh, yeah, okay. I, uh, we get to executive session when uh, our solicitor is present. He's handling the rezoning and uh, we can ask him at that time how far along he is with that. So uh, if, if that's ready to be completed, that could be approved. And if not, we could pull it from the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Boone, I appreciate that. Uh, the second item is the high school ventilation repair update. And we had a credit from phase one of the Siemens project that will cover all of the repair costs involved with getting the few units in the high school back up to code and in working order. They plan on being on site next week and complete by October 19th at the very latest. The last item is the fields. Uh, and I heard from Pete earlier that uh, we do have funding to cover all of those items, as well as some very generous donations. So I think we have, I know for sure we have competitive bids for the fencing. Um, we still need, I believe, additional bids for the electrical for the scoreboard. And the brush removal was, I think, pretty much a, a minimal cost. And I would think that we could move that one ahead for next week's meeting. Excellent. Excellent. Mr. Mahalik, is there any comments from the board or public? At this time, At this time there, are, there no are no comments, comments or... or Questions, Questions for physical, for physical plant, plant, Mrs. Haddix. Thank you. I move to adjourn. Second. We have a we second. Have a second. Mrs. Haddix, we do have a second. So we are closed. Thank you. Right. We will close the physical plant and grounds committee meeting. Thank you again, Mrs. Haddix. At this time, we will open our academic programs agenda for this October 8th. Uh, call to order with uh, Mr. Boone, who is our chairman. He is, uh, he is with us. Mrs. Bibla is with us, and Mrs. McCurdy. I'm hoping Mrs. McCurdy can hear us. I haven't been able to make contact, but we can see you on Zoom. There we go. I'm, I'm glad you're with us, Lauren. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve the, minute, you, the minutes of the September 10th, 2020 Academic Committee uh, meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Um, there are no active uh, things to move on to the agenda. There are open discussions. Mr. Mahalik, I'll defer to you on those. Thank you, Thank you so very, very much, much, Mr. Boone. And we will, we will now begin, begin taking uh, comments, comments and questions, questions from, uh, from, uh, from the public. The public. I think Mr. Brummigen will read the questions, questions and we will try to, right. I'm sorry, I'm sorry Mr. Brummigen, Mr. Mr. Blanchard <laughs> will, will <laughs> read the questions <laughs> and we yeah, will uh, uh, certainly do our very best, best to get everybody's yeah, question yeah, answered. Thank you, Mr. Mahalik.
bear with me as I dig through some of the questions. Take your time. Tracy Ann um, asks, since it is the school board's responsibility to represent the will of the parents and taxpayers, can we send another survey similar to the one sent in the beginning of the year to ask the parents and students if they wish to remain virtual, hybrid, or full return? Yes, we will, we will be doing that. Thank you. Gina Lutz asks if we've mentioned anything about revisiting when school could open. We are, and uh, <clears throat> certainly uh, the administrative team uh, will continue to meet and provide uh, discussions uh, with our association and our Board of Education, and uh, certainly we will be looking to do just, just that. Kent Sellers says, what if the parents that want their kids to go back sign a waiver that the kids can go back? Then the parents that don't want the kids to go back keep the kids home. Both sides are happy. Thank you. I know Mrs. McCurdy, I was uh, speaking with some uh, regarding waivers. Uh, that's definitely something that is uh, in consideration. Gina Lutz also asked, can we also have an update on when the Chromebooks will be in for us to borrow for our kids in virtual cyber? Last I heard on the second day of school was the estimate of six to eight weeks from the date. I'm gonna answer that. Please. Um, I would recommend if you do need assistance, please contact your building administrator. Um, we are waiting for a new purchase to come in. I think along with other school districts, there has been a heavy delay um, due to the um, surplus of requests throughout the country and it's really you know at the mercies of the vendor but we we are obviously still waiting but we we do have you know um, some available so if you are in desperate need please reach out to your billing administrator thank you Sandra Lee commented, if you can't send your kids to school to learn, you can't do sports or after-school activities. Thank you for that comment. Amanda Madrovsky, uh, why wasn't anyone aware of the 352,000 in the Jenny account? Did I pronounce that right? Uh, I'll answer that. Uh, Damian, we are, uh, Amanda, was it? Yes. Yeah, I, I think, uh, what, what Pete had said earlier was we were aware of it. We just, uh, the, it was not listed as a capital projects fund. We thought it was a, a part of the general fund. Pete, if you want to clarify that answer. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Mr. Swank is correct. I had assumed, I had thought it was part of the uh, general fund, but however, it was, it's actually part of the, uh, the capital projects account. So there's money available in the capital projects account that was used as a, it's actually a certificate of deposit or an investment. So it actually is earning interest as a capital projects account and not part of the general fund. Thank you both. Um, Tom Stavitsky asked if there was an update on the boiler room. I apologize if that was mentioned. Uh, the, the boiler room? Yes, I believe on the new boiler. Yep, so Mr. Brumagen, would you like to give an update on the boiler room? There's no action on our boiler room. Right at this point, our, if you're speaking of the high school boilers for the heat, I'm assuming, uh, we have both our boilers up and running and we're not paying any, anything for any additional uh, upgrades at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Sandra Lee asks, what's more important, students' education or sports? Uh, I would say that, that education encompasses academics, co-curricular, as well as socialization. Thank you. Laura Klaposki 
I apologize if I pronounce that wrong, uh, can any of the board members let us know if there was any data collected by teachers on how many of their students were struggling with distance learning made available to them? And if this data was considered in the decision to continue our students on a learning model that is not working for many? So that data would come from our uh, administration. Uh, and certainly if there are students, we, 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 we are assessing, uh, grading, as we would if our students were in person. So any child that is having academic struggles, we absolutely would be made aware of it through our teachers, uh, and that would be handled as it would if they were right here with us. Uh, Hold on one second, Damien. We have a gentleman at the stand. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I apologize if any of this has been answered, but I'm just coming from work. Um, I'm just curious, with the decision that was made last night, is if there is certain criteria that you are looking for towards making a decision to return children to school. And what was the main reason people voted no? If it's a technology issue, then that's a technology issue. If it's a protection to the community, your job as board members are to look out for the education of the children, not necessarily the safety of the, the, safety of the um, community. <clears throat> if it's waiting for a vaccine, that could be months or a year. There are still viruses that do not have a vaccine. And then, if people are, are you, and if you are waiting for a vaccine, are there going to be people that are allowed to not get the vaccine and continue to come to your school? <clears throat> you have been doing disservice to many of the elementary children that are struggling daily in their homes. I am homeschooling three of my children. Two are in elementary school, one is in the middle school. I split my time between homeschooling and being at, at work. It is a daily fight with my second grader. And it is a disservice to her and her learning abilities when they need to learn to read and write and function daily. I do have to commend you and the teachers on doing the best you can. No one knows what is happening. Everyone is doing their best. I do understand that. I will make a statement that says that you are allowing sports. Many of you on the school board have been at sporting events, but you are not allowing children in school. We're showing to them that sports are more important than their academics. I understand, and I apologize because I think it was discussed on my way in about the socialization of sports. I agree with that. I am a believer in sports, but sometimes academics has to be the priority. That's how it is in my house, and that is how it is in many houses of parents that I know. So that needs to be weighed heavily on your decision. If you're going to have one, you should have both. I've been working in healthcare since this started. I have not missed one day of work. I have treated many of the people that have been in the high risk categories. I have treated nursing home employees. I have treated healthcare workers that have been on the front lines, whether they were testing COVID patients or treating COVID patients. With appropriate and universal precautions, we have managed to not have one case in my office, and I have not been in I have not been exposed to any positive cases. I can speak to you from firsthand experience. There are other school districts that are allowing their kids to go back to school at a hybrid model and are having bumps. I understand that. That will happen. That is going to happen. That is life. We need to show everyone that there are bumps in the road and everybody can adjust to them. <clears throat> I do want to end with saying that I appreciate the teachers. Everyone is doing a hard 
are doing a very good job in a hard situation. My question for you is what is going to be the deciding factor? I listened to everybody vote last night and it was either a yes or a no. Mr. Swank explained. I appreciate your comments. Some other people, I did not know whether they voted yes or no, the reason they did. That needs to be outlined to the parents that yes, we want to get back to school, but we can't because we don't have the platform. We're not going back to school because of this, because of that. I think that would help your stance in the community a lot more than just the decision of yes and no. Thank you. Sir, and thank you so very much for those comments. I appreciate you being here. Can you just for the record state your name, just for the public record? Michael Shaluti. Thank you. And I, I can comment on my, my vote last night. Uh, week, weekly, I'm on a Zoom meeting with board presidents and vice presidents from across the state. Uh, I have many questions that I would like to have answered, and I think we need some input from our professional staff. Uh, I have not met with them. I've talked to the board president, but we, as a group, have not met. And the feedback from across the state on the hybrid, the students hate it, parents hate it, and those schools that have been in session now for six weeks, their professional staff is completely exhausted. That was part of my no vote. Another part, uh, I have grandchildren in a, a neighboring school district that had to shut down for a few days, and my, my, one of my worries when a school district shuts down, it's not because the students have the COVID, it's the professional staff or uh, uh, maybe the paraprofessionals. And that, that to me is a, a big worry. And I, I know where you're coming from. Uh, as far as the, the health concerns, I have a daughter and son-in-law, both work in the healthcare facet and you know things have been going smoothly there I am very worried about the academics I did have one discussion with the, the administration and uh, I talked with a member of my committee before we started tonight and we're going to try to set up a, a meeting with the uh, academic committee the administration I was going to talk to, to Bob after the meeting and uh, hopefully the the association the three of us get together because there are the the very young and those that have learning disabilities uh, I, I I strongly believe we've got to get those people back to school as soon as possible I know where you're coming from I just want a complete plan uh, before we move forward so we're not bouncing all over the place so I think uh, I'm hoping to get uh, that meeting going the first part of next week and to get, to get the ball rolling and see if we can get people to agree on how to come back, how to come back safely. That's a, that's a, a, a big concern. Academics, I ran on academics when I ran for school board, never envisioning what was going to happen this past year and uh, safety just, just moved into first place. Uh, but if we can do it safely, uh, we've got to get them back. Uh, I, if we're going to have that meeting, I think it should be public. It needs to be everybody's in. Second, I understand what we're saying. People don't like hybrid. Educators don't like hybrid. Students don't like hybrid. I'm hearing the same thing about virtual. Educators don't like virtual. Students don't like virtual. Parents don't like virtual. So there's dislike on both sides of it. It's not just everybody hates hybrid, so we're gonna do virtual. It's dislike on both sides. You have to weigh the option. Just to piggyback on Ms. Bibla's comments, Mr. Boone. Excuse um, me. No problem going public, ex except I think there might be some personnel issues involved there, which uh, should not be discussed in, in public. Uh, other than that, I. Well, uh, if we can come forward with a plan, 
uh, and, and, and present to the public again, I, I would be all for it, but I, I've got some questions about legality. Uh, even last night, uh, our, our solicitor stepped in and uh, those issues are brought up uh, when I'm talking with board members across the state. Uh, it was brought up on Tuesday. And there, there are certain things there, certain questions that would have to be answered if uh, staff is not able to come in uh, what what we can and cannot do and the legal issues uh, I think might prevent us from going public with that uh, Mr. Boone if I may just follow up um, as per our policy uh, for the Crestwood School District all committee meetings are to be made public so it's important that those type of committee meetings especially announced public meetings that are not administrative meetings are given the proper opportunity for the public to view executive session material that would require personnel should not also include those personnel being discussed. So they must be um, held at a different standard for executive session and should not be included in those discussions. Just wanna make sure that we're following the proper protocol. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I, I was not talking full executive session. I was talking a committee meeting, which according to our solicitor, if we have uh, less than four or less members of the board, uh, that it does not constitute a, a full meeting. We can, according to the Sunshine Laws, have that group meet. That's a correct thing, but our policy actually states that committee meetings are to be made in public. Thank you. I, I, I think uh, present board members and administration will have a discussion after tonight's meeting and see what we can get set up to get the ball rolling. Thank you. Um, Deb Cummings Dietrich, based on the guidelines issued in August, over 10% positive rate is full-time virtual. Five to 10% is blended and under 5% is blended or full in person. How do you approach a decision in determining how low of an infection rate it needs to be in order for students to return? So, we work very closely with our pandemic task force team made up of uh, our school, high school nurse. Uh, we have three doctors, area doctors on the team. Uh, myself, Mrs. McCurdy, Mrs. Spath. Uh, and we work very closely with them. We meet very regularly, at least once a week, sometimes more. And the input that we receive from the, the, professional, the professional staff, th those physicians, um, you know, we weigh heavily on. Uh, so th that's what we've been looking at. Uh, we look at the data, we look at the dashboard uh, that the Department of Health has put out. And certainly we're gonna follow all the guidelines uh, as it's presented to us. Thank you, Mr. Mahalik. Charlie Madrovsky, how is 352,000 hiding in plain sight in the Jenny Montgomery Fund? And why are old board members' names on a Jenny account? What is left in the account after baseball and softball fields are prioritized over the special education building? The money was in the on the treasury report every every month in the general fund. It was listed as a on the on the treasury report every month, so it was listed there as one of the accounts that was available. Um, as as the as the treasury report shows, every account is broken out, so the money was there every single you know, every single month. Um, it was not labeled as a capital funds project, so we thought so the 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 assumption was it was an investment account that was there to earn interest rate. Um, interest money on on the accrual so that you would earn interest income on the uh, as, as, a, as a revenue item um, I don't know what the second part of the question was about special education. Yeah, I'll answer that. I heard it um, oh. so <clears throat> I think the, the way it has to be viewed is uh, currently we are um, able to sufficiently uh, uh, provide um, Education and services to our special uh, needs um, community and what we're looking at doing is improving that situation uh, by expanding our facilities and taking over the, the uh, 
new home purchase as, a, as an administrative office. With the, uh, with the, the baseball fields and softball fields, you know, currently, if we don't do something, we will not have the ability to provide um, a playing field in the spring um, for, for our baseball team. So um, I don't know if you want to call it a priority, uh, but we need to have, have somewhere for, for our uh, student athletes to participate in that particular sport. Thank you both. Uh, Bob Derwin, as a result of this week's COVID case in the secondary campus, has contact tracing been conducted? What were those results? As I know of at least two students who have contracted the disease due to exposure in the high school. So, yes, of course. Yes, of, yes, of course, contact tracing was conducted. That's conducted by the Department of Health through us. Um, and if you know of two students that have it, then you know more than I know, because I've not been informed of that, sir. So maybe you could call me right after the meeting. Maybe I could call you. That's, again, something I don't know. Uh, it's certainly nothing the Department of Health has said to me, or, and I've communicated with them probably six to eight times since Sunday. It's nothing that the pandemic task force knows. Uh, so I would be, very, very, very interested in speaking with you as quickly as possible. Um, but I know that every single person that had exposure, uh, the Department of Health was made aware of. We followed the guidelines exactly. We made it known publicly the moment that I understood what we were dealing with. So, sir, the information that you are claiming right now is something that is very, very new to me. And I'd like to speak with you. So if you could please provide your number privately. Mr. Blanchard, I will call you the meeting this, uh, the moment this meeting ends. Thank you, Mr. Mahalik. Uh, Jennifer Porter, are you really going to keep the kids back if they are not taking well to the online and failing? Uh, repeat that again. I think she's asking if, if a student is students will fail failing, this year. are they gonna be held back if they're not taking to the online format? Uh, the, the students, again, if, if they're struggling, their teachers will be working with them. Uh, if it's a matter of not comprehending material, there's going to be interventions and supports as there would be as, in person. If it's, they're not logging on and we are showing that we are making uh, attempts to contact the families, contact the students, then of course there's going to be negative consequences in that case. So the this, this situation is obviously individualized and any kid that needs extra help is going to get extra help. Damien, please make sure that gentleman that asked that question that we have his name and number and that I can call him right when this is done. I will. Uh, Gina Lutz, uh, this follows on to the gentleman who spoke before. Uh, this is the question I'm interested in too. It would be great to hear some hard numbers and metrics. Are we shooting for a positive, a percent positive rate in the community, a vaccine? It's the total arbitrary and unknown for this long length of time that is causing the total despair at this point. So again, I, myself and the motions and, and actions that, that I take are led by the guidance of the Department of Health, the dashboard that's provided to us, uh, and that's, that's exactly what I'm going on, the, the data that is presented. Uh, Bob, I, I think to clarify, people are trying to get an idea of what, what that metric is, and isn't it the uh, number per 100,000 and the three levels there well, maybe is. you could speak to that. Yep. I, I don't think right. people understand that. So as, as and, and we've shared this uh, publicly with the, uh, with the uh, members of our community, shared it, of course, uh, online and in all the areas, the Department of Education has a dashboard. And you can look at that dashboard for the community you live in, and it shows you what level of infection rate you are at. And then it gives you very clear guidance 
as to the platform of education that you can deliver under that uh, infection rate. We currently remain under moderate. With moderate, we can be a hybrid model uh, and certainly a virtual model. There's a low rate, there's a substantial rate. Uh, so we are in the moderate rate at this, at this time. Thank you. Um, Ella Revel. Why are other schools thriving with hybrid programs and we are falling short in our current program? We need to allow our children to go back. I think, I, I think we're going to continue to look at uh, programming. Uh, again, th this is not something that we thought up of you know, a couple of hours ago. Th th this is something we've been talking about probably over the last eight, nine months. There's no clear path, but please understand these are committee meetings of the entire district. And while students aren't in school, the district's still operating and we're still moving. And nothing is more important than getting our students back, but we still need to conduct day-to-day -day business. So you're still going to hear us talking about uh, facilities and, and uh, you're going to hear us talking about doing other purchases and contracts and all those things that may not be the main topic on everyone's mind, including myself, but the business still must continue. And that's what you saw tonight, a presentation of something that we've been discussing to maybe possibly pr provide in-house special education services to students who we are not currently providing those services to. They are currently out of district. But this is something that is a discussion point. And these meetings are discussion points for the community, for the Board of Education, and for the administration. Thank you. Um, Sandra Lee comments, you need to ban sports and after-school activities until students go back to school to learn and communicate. Laura Laposki, please speak to the board president of Dallas. This is not the case there. Do you have a statistic comparing proficiency of students doing distant learning versus a district doing hybrid? She is making it work for Dallas. Uh, Penny Smith says, uh, bring the kids back to school. You aren't going to know if anything will work unless you try. These children are suffering academically, and it isn't fair to them. They need to be with friends and have social interactions. Thank you. Uh, Julie Porter, thank you for your comments and concerns. So many of us have had... I've had it watching these kids suffer. I'm sick as a grandmother watching my grandkids get further and further behind while I have to work. This is not working. Uh, Matt Dotzel, what is the process if a student is struggling? My son is struggling severely in second grade. I've reached out to the administration at Rice Elementary, and all has said help is available, but nothing is ever done. What can be done to help, so, to help other than returning to school in person? The very first thing uh, that I recommend is reach out to the teachers. The teachers are the most important person to go to. If you're not getting uh, the, the feedback that you feel you need or desire, then go to the administration. But I, I've never heard a, a, a parent say that our teachers have been unable or unwilling to discuss their child. Uh, so, and I'm not saying it may not have happened, but please start with the teacher. And then if you do not get the satisfaction from the teacher, please go to the administrator. If you do not get the satisfaction from the administrator, please come to me. I promise you, we will address your concern. I will make a comment that Amanda Madrowski is actually in here also and followed up with her own phone number to reach out to this parent. Um, Deb Dietrich asks, can you tell me what our current COVID infection rate is for our, our county? I would say look at the dashboard. That would be your, your best guide. Um, Matt Dotz will ask if academics is important. Why does the learning support teacher at Rice Elementary coach her sport instead of taking part in scheduled online sessions with IEP students? Not aware of that. That's 
that's a personnel issue. I don't think that should even be discussed. Or you should be made aware of it. Thank you, Mr. Swain. Tom Stavitsky, Mr. Mahalik, will the future reopening decisions be a monthly or quarterly decision? You know, I'm just having a little difficult time uh, hearing I'm you. I'm sorry. I, if I could follow up on that, Mr. Mahalik, that's okay. Um, I believe it was Mr. Stavitsky. Yes. And he, he just asked uh, Mr. Mahalik um, in regards to essentially a timetable. Would it be something that was evaluated? And that, that was a question that I had, so I apologize for jumping into Mr. Stavitsky's question, but I think they're the same. You know, when, we, when the, the year began and uh, we decided to move forward with a uh, virtual model to give time to plan because the original plan of five days was, was changed due to changes within the Department of Health and Department of Education, we, we were very specific in our timetable. October 1st evaluation, last night, um, the, the motion that was made available was very specific on a start date. So we tried to connect to those lines. Now that that motion failed by the majority of the board, do we have a specific timetable as to if a reevaluation will take place? Or have you spoken to um, any of the board members that did vote no in a timetable manner to share with those of us in the community that do not know any specifics times as um, I hear we we keep saying and I've heard this over and over again as soon as we can but I think the community deserves as well as this board deserves uh, and our students absolutely deserve some really concrete timetables gave timetables October 1st we stuck to it we did a presentation, we called it an emergency board meeting, voted on it for 19th, that didn't pass. I think our, we, we need to have some real specific hard lines of where we're going forward for the community. And I think that in essence, Damien got Tom's question as well. Oh, okay, so I just, yep. in his was asking, I believe weekly, quarterly, semesterly, would it be an evaluation yep. at that point? So uh, th thank you, Tom, uh, and, and thank you, Mr. President. Uh, yeah, we, so we are just about 20 hours from the uh, vote of yesterday. So, it, yes, my, myself and my administration team uh, are planning on meeting, and we are going to, again, look at uh, other options that we can present to the Board of Education. Uh, we will have discussions with our association. So that will be forthcoming. And Mr. President, I thank you for, uh, you know, for pointing out that we were very clear on August 12th that we would uh, make a uh, decision and make an announcement on October 1st, which we did do. Uh, and and uh, so we, we will, again, continue to uh, communicate with the public uh, as frequent as we had. But at this point, we, we are still just 20 hours from that vote um, and with everybody having a lot of stuff on their plates today, nothing more important than this, um, you know, we will be meeting as an administration, come up with, uh, you know, some other, uh, at least some other discussions to see how we can take what we currently have and, um, and move that forward. What we do know, what we do know, and the gentleman all the way to my, to my end on the left, I have, a tremendous amount of respect for Randy Swank for many, many reasons, uh, but, but he's an awesome person. But at this point, we know that coming back fully with the number of kids that would be coming back is, is not possible. We, that we would, be, we would be thumbing ourselves uh, to the guidelines and the mandates that, that, are, that are in front of us. So now, some school districts are doing it, but that is because the number of kids that they have still allows them to have that six feet. All right? And that six feet is very, very important. Very important. Um, and so right now, all students back without six feet wouldn't be possible. Now, if the situation would be that 60, 70 percent of our students said, we're going to stay virtual. We're staying in cyber, and we only had 30% of our kids district-wide coming back, 
then we could probably come back full time because that would still give us that six feet. So knowing that that's off the table, you know, we're looking really truly only at a hybrid model. So we've got to figure out how we can make a hybrid to where everybody feels comfortable, everybody feels safe, everybody feels that we're providing the best academic supports and services to our students. And, and that's what we're going to do uh, moving forward. Just to, um, just to follow up, Mr. Mahalik, um, and again, I, I do realize it's only been a, a sheer, short few hours and, and, and not to do that. Can, can you put a hard line in for our community to say by our board meeting next Thursday that you'll have some timetables, exact dates, times, locations? I, I suggest talking to those board members that voted no to get their feedback um, as to why they chose that. I know that was a question asked earlier as well as, as look at some of those situations so we could at least communicate to the community at the next board meeting um, some timetables of evaluation, plans, and so forth. W would that be enough time? Yes, sir. Okay. I think that is very adequate. And, and, and just a follow-up point, because the, the, the point you did bring up about the hybrid model moving into the five-day-a-week model, uh, that was discussed last night, I know, because I discussed it. And we really have to... we can't put the cart before the horse we have to move to the hybrid model first and if the hybrid model then was to work uh, and, and will work um, essentially if we had enough students that said you know what I just choose to stay virtual for a variety of different reasons maybe that learning model is working for me maybe my health uh, and well-being or a family member that I live with is is constituting me to stay home they would have that option we would never force a child into our school during this time but that would then allow for the opportunity for our students to, to possibly thin out in numbers and get to five days, which I believe when I do hear many of the school districts, which I've done I, 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 well, quite a bit of research, the reality would be that um, many of them are moving out of the hybrid model and moving into a model of five days a week simply because they've gone through the proper steps and have had a hybrid model Students have chosen what they're in, they've gotten their numbers down low enough, and we've been able to get those districts are doing the six feet. So we really have to get the, the, the carts, you know, the, the process started before we could just jump in, unless there's a change by the Department of Health and Department of Education. Am I incorrect in that understanding? Yes, sir. Thank you. What, what about the uh, survey? Can we get that done? Yes, sir. That, 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 that will be that could be, very soon. That could change those numbers it to can. the point where we do have six feet. And, and then could go right back uh, all, all in. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, Deb Dietrich, can we be more informed on the pandemic task force? Who are the members of this committee? Yes, it's uh, myself, Mrs. Haddix. I'm sorry, it's Mrs. McCurdy. It is um, Mrs. Spath. It is Mrs. Tomek. It is Dr. Childs. It is uh, Dr. Stiefert, uh, and it is Dr. Joseph. Thank you. Um, Katie makes a comment. I work at a daycare, and we take care of 42 school age online, and half these teachers teach for 10 to 15 minutes. Then they are off for hours and tells the student to go on wonders and other sites. Really, half the kids don't even understand what they're doing when they are not taught the proper way. Amanda, uh, at, well, look, let, let me let me let me go. I, that that deserves to be addressed. So, first I'm hearing of this. I'm going to assume it's the first that uh, Mr. Sir and Mrs. Gregory are hearing about this. I, I, I can only assume because I could guarantee you they would have contacted me immediately. Uh, so I I think what's important, if you can, please get the name of that person. I'd like to set up a meeting with, uh, with uh, Mr. Sarah and Mrs. Gregory so that can be addressed. Because those, are, again, are really, really heavy statements to be made. Uh, and this is public, so I'm going to, you know, I, I'm certainly going to do all I can to find out. If that, because I've not heard that from anyone else before this moment right now. So when I hear things like, well, I've got two positive kids, and I've never heard that before, this is the reaction you're going to get. When I hear that my teachers are only on for 10 minutes and I've never heard that before, you know, we are going to, we're going to research that because we can't just let that stuff be out there. If it's true, we're going to address it. If it's not true, 
we're going to set the record straight. Thank you. Amanda Lukashevsky, uh, I understand St. Jude's is part of the diocese, but how is it that they can be full-time in person and the neighboring Crestwood schools cannot even do hybrid? Probably be best to ask the, uh, the Scranton Diocese that question. Well, Bob, I'm sure it's, they must have the six feet available. Uh, they, they limited their enrollment and they have uh, the uh, uh, physical capabilities to socially distance. Yeah, again, and that may be, but I think the best would be to ask them directly because I, I have no, no ideas. I work very, very closely with Sister Ellen, a wonderful person, but I have no idea what, what the makeup of their classrooms are like. And just to follow up on a previous question, only because I do have a, a, a live feed, um, I did look up the monitoring dashboard for Luzerne County. Our PCR percent positivity, most recent within seven days, is only at 2.5%. The difference in average daily number of COVID-19 hospitalizations is a negative 4.8%. And our incident rate, most recent seven days per 100,000 residents is 25.8%. Um, percent of hospital emergency department visits uh, is 0 0.4. So if the individual was able to not find that online, I, w I was able to look that up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Randy. Bachor, I apologize. Uh, people have a choice online. We should have the choice for in person. Wilkesbury is open five days a week, so are so you are saying they aren't following protocol. Well, I, I could jump in as a teacher of the Wilkesbury School District, and I spoke to this last night. Um, protocols are in place, as they are as in Dallas, Northwest, Lake Lehman, Anacoke, uh, Hanover, uh, Tunkhannock. Um, I think I believe all those schools are either in a hybrid model or have their students in place and um, or they're in a five day a week and I can speak to Wilkesbury since that was brought up directly and I have firsthand knowledge again in a system where students have a choice and parents have a choice to be either virtual and or in person enough of the students chose a virtual model to keep those numbers low and therefore five days a week for all students not just a limited number or individuals that feel they're at a shorter number, or, you know, primary or uh, intermediate or, or secondary, all students are treated the same, not just some. And uh, they're all brought back then, whether it be in a five day or a hybrid model uh, situation. Thank you. Uh, Chastity Gurton uh, makes a comment. It's not just small children struggling. A person must be extremely disciplined to do schooling from home under little or no supervision. Adults struggle with this. How can we expect this from our children? At least with the proposed hybrid model, children would be in classrooms two days a week and then live in a virtual classroom the other days. I feel the proposed model was a step in the right direction. Keeping these children home is not working. It's hindering them. We appear to be the only school district not even attempting to try this. We can't assume it. It will fail. Thank you. Uh, Julie Porter, I'd like to know how many parents chose cyber as opposed to returning. How many children will be in each building? So we, we, the, the number of cyber is 650. Uh, our cases, I, I, and I've, our number of uh, students, I mean, again, I've got Mr. Sarah and Mrs. Gregory here uh, looking at, uh, Mr. Sarah, you want to, uh, Mr. Greg, you want to give us K to six uh, about the average classroom numbers? Can we turn up Mr. Sarah, please? Go ahead, say it. Go ahead, Kevin. Kevin. There's no average class size. It, it's anywhere from a class size of 17, class sizes of 25, 26. Based on our cyber enrollments, 425 students remain in Fairview to remove Thank you. So what you heard from Mr. Sir, and I think Mrs. Gregory is pretty close in most grade levels. She's got some higher grades, but what you're hearing is those numbers would be in the hybrid model, not coming back fully, but that would be the hybrid model. So 
as, a, as we prepared for the hybrid model, there were 13 students was the highest number coming back inside a single classroom in an A group, 13 in a B group. And in certain instances, the splits were eight in an A group, B, or eight in a B group. It, it varied by, while, widely because of the cyber enrollments are fluctuated. At Rice Elementary, I would have a total of 610 students returning, not at the same time, but both A and B group. There would be about 305 in group A and about 306 in group B. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gorm, Mrs. Foster, again, I, I know we are still working on those numbers. We will continue working on those numbers. The average class size, uh, does anyone have that? If you could share that, if, if possible. Again, I know the complexity of the high school is much, much different than the elementary, but do we have numbers like an average class for the hybrid model? Yeah, can you hear me? It's Mr. Gorm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So the so just to use round numbers, um, approximately thirteen hundred students on the secondary campus. Um, we have uh, approximately, and like Mr. Sarah said, it fluctuates because uh, we have had some movement as of recently. But we have approximately two hundred and fifty students in the cyber academy on the secondary campus. So that still leaves over a thousand kids that would be returning for the hybrid model. If we split that into, you know, an A and a B group, we still have approximately, you know, 525 students per group. So um, we still have a large number that would be coming into the building for hybrid. We have approximately 250 uh, still in the Cyber Academy, grades 7 through 12. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tony. Wireless makes a comment or maybe a question, but how are other schools able to do hybrid when they've been out since March 13th yet doing hybrid? I, because their board approved it. Uh, Charlie Madrovsky, last question about the 352,000. If it was simply misclassified or misconstrued, does this reduce operating funds by this amount? And if so, what does this do to the fund balance for OPEX? The fund, the, the district, the, the, wasn't a reclassification error. The money was always placed in the proper um, buckets. It was, it was never misplaced in any particular area. So on every report, on every AFR, on every district audit, it was always there. It was just never, no, it was never really brought to anybody's attention that it was in there. Um, because the auditors didn't even think anything of it. It was just my noticing of it when I was going through and, and doing the, the, the workbooks. So it was never anything like that. So that's kind of, I just thought it was part of, I had assumed that it was part of the um, general fund, but it was not. It was a capital funds project. So that, I hope that answers the question. It was never um, part of the general fund ever from, at any point. Um, from 2006 to 2020 was never part of the general fund. So there was never any misclassification or misuse or anything like that. So there was never any effect to the general fund or any general ledgers or anything like that. Thank you. Laura Klaposki, uh, can I get an answer on a statistic on percent of students on track with their curriculums? Uh, on track, was reset. Uh, can she get uh, a statistic on the percentage of students on track with their curriculums? Uh, yeah, I, I don't have a percentage with me. Again, that would be something that our building administrators, uh, especially, especially each Friday, uh, they uh, get together and they look at those numbers. Uh, so I personally don't right now have a statistic that I can give you of kids that are on track, um, but I certainly uh, would, would, uh, would, would pose that question to my, uh, to my principals. And if we're speaking specifically about your own child, please make sure 
you're reaching out and discussing how they're doing if you're not aware of how your child's doing. But please, always reach out to your teacher. Reach out to uh, the administrator if you're not getting the answers from the teachers. Uh, thank you. Uh, at this time, um, it's, it's been about two hours and 15 minutes, and we're going to take a quick five-minute um, restroom recess for anyone who needs sure. to use the restroom, and we'll be able to start up at 6.20. So I, 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 I ask those in community, in our social uh, media platforms, to just um, hang tight for a few moments, and it is 6.15 on my computer, and we will begin again at 6.20 for any board member that needs a, a quick break. Thank you. Thank you.
I, I just want to thank our community members and, and all the board members for allowing us that um, it ended up being about seven minutes and I, I truly appreciate it. Um, again, uh, Mr. Blanchard, if you want to continue with questions for the board. Thank you, Mr. Costello. Um, Lauren Elizabeth, how are you prepared to take the upcoming flu season into consideration? Will the school stay closed during any cough or sneeze? They'll never go back. Stephanie Weber, uh, what measures are being taken in terms of technology for teachers if they have to do in-person and online training or learning? I can answer that. Um, right now, we're looking into what a classroom will feel like in a hybrid model. Um, we did consider before yesterday's vote to add a microphone to the classroom to help with students at home to hear better if the teacher was working between the laptop and their Promethean board. We're also looking at ways um, to use the Promethean board as second monitors to help visually for the teacher to watch both their students um, in the virtual environment and into the classroom. So um, I am personally working on that and we will continue to do that as we progress forward. And Mr. Blanchard, if I could follow on on that, and I know you answered this question yesterday, I just want to answer it again. Um, when you, it was asked, can we handle a hybrid model technologically within our district? If you can give the short answer since you gave us a very in-depth answer yesterday, um, please. Yes, I do believe um, we can handle it. And, and I think as was mentioned yesterday, there is two parts that I think from, a, from an internet speed and infrastructural capacity of handling all the devices at once, we can. Um, where we do obviously have to iron out some of the kinks is what I just mentioned to this individual that we're working on. But I do believe we can handle it. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer Porter asks, is there any thought of bringing back K through three? Yes, uh, that, that is something that has been discussed uh, and will uh, continue to be discussed as, as well. Uh, Randy Ocker, how do you know what percentage of people would come back the school has never asked? Well, we, we have asked, uh, and I think we would use the data of 650 students in cyber as a pretty good measuring stick of those people who do not feel comfortable coming back. 650 still leaves us with about 2,400 students, uh, which still is a lot, a lot of students and doesn't give us the six feet. So we've asked probably a whole bunch of times and that's how we got to that 650 in cyber. Thank you. Uh, Julie Porter, are you saying we can't add trailers if necessary to each school? Trailers? Yes. That's probably eight to 12 months. Uh, zoning is involved. Uh, th th that's a very, very intensive uh, process to do trailers with, with you, you need running water, you need electricity. Uh, you need a foundation, you need bathrooms. Uh, that, that, that's a large, large, large undertaking. Thank you. Um, this goes, I think, with the other question, Amy May. What about bringing elementary K through four back, spread amongst the schools, five to six back in the middle school, and seven to 12 staying virtual? Um, a proposal that's been discussed, and I expect it'll be discussed uh, in, in, in more detail. Thank you. If Dan, I can, can I, follow can up. Can I say oh, something? Sure, that? absolutely. Uh, in just my opinion, I don't think we can choose one population of kids over the other. I think all kids are struggling at some point. And I just follow up too, I would like to know if that is a violation of uh, free and appropriate public education, though we're offering public education in a virtual model for our, our, a different population age group, we're not offering the same type of education and therefore uh, in my opinion, that would be a violation of FAPE if you can't offer the same value public education for all age groups. Thank you. Um, Jennifer Porter makes the comment, I would also like to set up a meeting. My children aren't logging in between live classes. 
Sure. So, so Mrs. Porter, I'm not exactly sure where your children attend. If it's um, if it's cyber and it's elementary, please reach out to Mr. Sayre. If it's cyber and it's secondary, please reach out to Mr. Gorham. If they are in our virtual, please reach out to your building principal. We will, uh, we will assist. Um, Virginia Trushel. Most classes of live instruction for my children are 15 to 20 minutes, and then they are sent to do individual work. There is so much downtime, it's beyond ridiculous. Thank you. Amy May, um, okay, I think this goes into, I'm sorry, this goes back to that same question about splitting. Uh, Laura Klopaski, uh, when the survey is issued, can there be an option to vote for five day, but also settle for hybrid if five day not a viable option as far as numbers? Yes, we, we will certainly, we will certainly add that. We'll uh, make a point of reference that a five-day option would only be available if social, distance, social distancing allowed for that. So that would be all about numbers at that point. Um, Bill Kane asked Mr. Costello, what percentage of students are face-to-face -face at Wilkes-Barre? I would suggest Mr. Kane contacts the administration of Wilkes-Barre as I'm a teacher there, not an administrator or part of their board. Um, Paige Sears references 75% uh, of the students returned full time at Lake Lehman. Um, Justin Cromes, this information would have been more pertinent yesterday for the board members to make their decision. Was this class size information provided then prior to the vote? This class size has been known by our Board of Education since the very first day. Communication with the Board of Education is my top priority. They need to know what they're voting on, what's happening in our district uh, day by day. So, yes, that information is provided. Laura Klapaski, I know my student is a mess without school. My point is I have heard that same from countless other parents. I'm wondering how the decision to go back or not was even made without the research on how effective or ineffective distance learning has been overall in our district. Again, if there was ne never a thing called pandemics, COVID, coronavirus, th this would not be something we would do. We, we didn't pull this out of the air. We didn't say, hey, let's do this, okay? Uh, and, I, and I'm not trying to be uh, dismissive. I, I'm saying, you know, this is the hand we've been dealt with. And we are trying to do the very best with the hand that we are dealt with. Uh, but again, this would not even be a discussion point if we weren't where we were. Uh, up to this point, we have done, I think, an incredible job providing a very consistent education. Is it working for everyone? No. And we knew it wasn't going to. Coronavirus doesn't work for everyone. It's not really, it's not really convenient for a school system. Uh, again, the, the, the option of a hybrid was not was not chosen so we're going to now look to see how we can make this uh so it is favorable for everyone that's involved thank you um jennifer lapsansky still says um i'm sorry if this was already mentioned but what exactly is the criteria that you're trying to meet to get the kids back to school five board votes to approve a plan is the criteria at this point. Thank for, you. For, for, for me, it's um, six feet social distancing as, as much as possible, uh, but absolutely necessary whenever a kid is going to be in a situation of 15 minutes or more. Um, Stephanie Weber comments a survey from March does not apply now. We need a new one. Uh, Jack Frizzo, now that it is brought to light that virtual learning is not what you presented in August, what will you do to address it? 
What have the principals been doing for five weeks, if not inspecting any instruction? Uh, who is that from? Uh, Jack Frizzo. Mr. Frizzo, have you reached out to the principals? Have you reached out to the teachers? Uh, Gina Lutz comments on, I believe, the question regarding splitting up the grades. I get it might be violating certain laws, but I was told this is a pandemic and the rest of the rules have been modified. Not to my knowledge has fate been modified in a situation from that. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's not on the table of legislators' desk, but that's not something that the school board or administration has control over. Thank you. Katie asks, why can't these teachers teach in their classrooms, not in their homes? That's uh, an administrative decision. Um, Tony asked, the busing survey that came out in August, if a parent changes their mind about busing choice administration approval is required, what does that mean and how long does that take? Generally five days. So I'm, I'm assuming that they need transportation now. Uh, if it's just that they're going to transport uh, a child themselves, then again, I would uh, ask you to please reach out to Mrs. Nealon. Uh, and it could be less than five days, but at, at this time now, when we do come back, there will be assigned seating. Um, so it, it may be a little longer than, than normal. Thank you. Glenna Hart, uh, was there a clear guideline or outline for our teachers on teaching virtual? Examples, uh, expectation on actual time spent with students. I feel for all this is a trying time for our students, parents, and teachers. There, there was a tremendous amount of uh, professional development that was uh, delivered to our faculty uh, from uh, late last year and all through the summer and it continues now and that is all the questions thank Excellent. you mr blanchard any other comments by members of the board uh, I think Mr. Sayre has a question, and I think uh, he has a presentation he has to give to the board tonight well, on federal programs, no, we, correct? No, we took the uh, presentation off. We're going to hold that in November. Okay. Mr. Sayre, Mr. Sayre, please start over. Please start over. You were muted. I said it's near impossible for Mr. to give a response to K-12 to what the expectation is during virtual. The expectation is that second grade teachers regard to the amount of time they spent online and literally the expression I used was hand holding to not inconvenience the parents and caregivers versus what a sophomore in high school can handle and what meaningful instruction would look like. so you know in terms of what he is attempting to answer a question regarding our administrative direction specific to teachers that there's a lot of subtleties to that there's a lot of context to that that would need to be addressed uh, I can assure you speaking for the administrative team we've worked with the individual teachers by grade level by content area and even within grade levels you know depending on the level of, of facts you're talking about, it can vary. So it, I, I wanted to assist Mr. Mahalik in his response to that question because to respond to that down the middle, K to 12, is impossible and uh, wouldn't be effective. Thank you, Thank Mr. You, Mr. Sir. Any other comments by members of the board or uh, administrators? Seeing none, then I want to thank our community and the board for being part of our committee meetings to set the agenda. I want to encourage everyone to uh, view our agenda outline that will be posted tomorrow for uh, stakeholders to review, as well as a formal agenda will be presented sometime uh, by next, around next Tuesday. And our board meeting is next Thursday, August or October 15th at 6.30. Uh, once again, here in the auditorium for those that would like to be in place. 
as well as we will have a virtual option. Uh, and with that, I wish everyone a good evening.